several years ago, there was a company that ran commercials about going back to school. And in those commercials, the music to the commercial was, it's the most wonderful time of the year. You remember that? Yeah, and the parents were shopping for supplies and riding the carts down the aisles and all of that. It was, it's amazing. I remember a time when January 1st was, was exciting because that was the new year, but then our kids were born and we just wanted them out of the house. And so school year was just an amazing, amazing beginning. I think maybe it's that way for others, not just us. So tonight we're having, by the way, a tea and talk and a back to school fellowship. Uh, to celebrate our young people beginning another school year. It was supposed to have been last week, but we had the flooding event here at the building. In fact, I came up here, if you didn't know this, I came up here about an hour before we were scheduled to have services, and there were ducks swimming in the parking lot. There was so much water. So uh, so we put that off to this week, and, and that'll be tonight, and we'll celebrate a new year, a new school year. And in that line of thinking, I thought I would talk about some of that this morning as well, but I'm not talking about our young people, at least not just our young people. I'm talking about all of us because I think events like this give us the chance to maybe refocus, uh, maybe do where I come from what you'd call turning over a new leaf, you know, starting again, maybe, maybe being able to forget a little bit of what's been in the past and have something new for the future and so so this morning, what I'm talking about is goals, goals to make this the most wonderful time of the year, not just our kids going back to school, but a new commitment, a new uh, solid direction of our faith, and also for this church. So what principles can make this new start, uh, a new beginning, uh, better, better than it was even yesterday? Number one, let's plan to be like Jesus every day day. Now, that doesn't matter whether you're a student or an adult, does it? I mean, that ought to be our goal, right? If we're going to be Christians, which the word carries with it the idea of Christ-like, I kind of need to plan to do that, right? It's not something that's just going to happen accidentally. The key word to this point is the word plan. You have to be somebody who actually puts something into place to reach the end goal. And you know what it looks like when there's less than that commitment. Maybe you've got a friend that you invite to worship services and they, they respond by saying, you know what, I'll try, but I won't promise anything. And you know, you know at that point that, you know, maybe they will, but more than likely they're not going to be there. And that's because there's no commitment. There's no plan. There's no plan. You remember the words of James? In James chapter 4, it's a passage we use quite frequently, beginning of verse 13, where James says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Now, that passage... I think we rightfully take from it the idea that, that, that life is brief, right? And you don't know if you have tomorrow, and you don't know what the future is, and so you have, to have, uh, you have to have a commitment to living today. We know that passage is about the brevity of life, but that's not all it's about. It is about the brevity of life, but the conclusion to the fact that we live a life that can be gone in a moment is you plan today to be who God wants you to be today because you might not have the opportunity to do that tomorrow. It's about planning. It's about making Jesus the centerpiece of my life every single day that I'm alive. And if I put that off until tomorrow, well, what am I going to do tomorrow? Am I going to put it off again until tomorrow? And eventually, am I going to run out of those? And so the idea of this first point is that Jesus has to be a part of everything that I do. He has to be a part of everywhere that I go. He has to be a part of everyone that I know. And he has to be a part of everything that I am. And that won't happen without me planning for it to happen. There's another account 
that I think we're quite familiar with of a man who didn't plan this way, and Jesus presents him to us. It's in Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 16, where we're told, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods, And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And we know that what Jesus was telling us is that life again is is brief. And so we look at the account and we wonder, what's the problem with this one? What's going wrong? What is Jesus trying to say to us? He's not condemning the man's wealth. He's not condemning the man's hard work. He's not saying this guy does not have the right to enjoy the fruits of his labor. He's saying the guy had no plans that included God. Everything was about his wealth or his uh, ability or his blessings or reaping the rewards of all of that. None of it had to do with God. And what was going to happen is he was about to die and all that stuff was just going to be gone. And the plan that he never put into place was the plan that he needed. He left God out of his plans. I don't want to be that person. Got to be a person that plans on God being a part of all of my life, right? I see that in the conclusion that Jesus gives in that parable in verse 20 when he says, But God said to him, You fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be? which you have provided. He's a fool, not because he worked hard. He's a fool, not because he has had immense blessings. He's a fool because he didn't make any plans beyond those blessings. He's a fool because he didn't plan to have God as a part of all of his life. God will not be a part of your life unless you plan for him to be there. You have, to, you have to make this happen. Everybody's struggling. So, so much struggle in our lives. So much division and so much decay. So much death. So much sickness. So many families in trouble. So many lives struggling. So much trauma on the television and the news every single day. And people are just trying to figure out how to make life better. And it is so simple. Just make sure God's a part of it. Make sure God's a part of it. That's how your life gets better. But you've got to plan that. Remember when Daniel was taken captive along with the other youths in the very early part of that Babylonian uh, oppression and captivity? You remember? And he, this is my plan. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what I'm going to face. I don't know how it's going to affect me. But here's what I do know. I'm going to be with God in a, no matter what it is. Now, you want to know what that looks like in our lives? What this means is that I am going to, today, make a big decision for my life before I ever know what I'm going to face the rest of today or tomorrow or next week or next year or next decade, that I'm going to make a decision today that whatever that is, that I'm going to face it with God. You know, I'm going to be connected to God in everything. That's the big decision of my life. Now, here's what happens. When I make that big decision... I already have help with all the little ones that I'm going to face. And they don't always feel like little ones, do they? The temptations, they may not be little. For example, maybe maybe this year you're going to be tempted to commit adultery. You know how you're going to deal with that? How you're going to beat that? You make the decision today before that temptation ever came up that says, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to have God as a part of my life. That's my plan. So I don't have to worry about that temptation later because it's already been handled before it ever gets here. You may be tempted with the opportunity to cheat. Maybe that is a cheating on a test in the school. Maybe it's a cheating on your boss at work. Maybe it's a cheating on your taxes. Maybe it's a cheating on the company that the check, the cashier gave you too much change back when you walked out the door. It doesn't matter what it's about. Those are all little decisions or little temptations that may face you at some point in your life. But if you make the decision today, the plan today that says no matter what those decisions are or those temptations are, I've decided today I'm going to have God in my life That's the big decision. 
and I've already made the little ones. And maybe I won't be overcome. I think that's what Paul was writing about in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, when he told us that we were to be transformed and to be living sacrifices. See, I make the decision that I'm going to put myself on the altar of God today. And you know what? Those sacrifices don't crawl off the altar, do they? So I'm, if I'm putting myself on the altar today, then all the rest of it's going to follow through. I don't know what tomorrow holds. But I know if I make the commitment to be like Jesus every day, then tomorrow's going to find success. So plan on it. Plan on it to be like Jesus every day. Number two, let's commit to not growing weary in well-doing. And I think the obvious passage in that one is Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, where Paul says, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Now there's a context to that passage, and he's talking about the spiritual investments that we make. He's talking about the investments with each other. He's talking about me investing in my own spiritual life and the needs that I have there and making sure that all that's taken care of. And he's telling us, you know, obviously there are times that you get tired. There are times that you get weary. But don't give up because if you don't give up, if you finish the race, your labor is not in vain. And you know what? It doesn't matter what man thinks. It doesn't matter if anybody ever thinks you're successful or not. It doesn't matter if the world sees any value in these decisions that you're making in your life. What matters is the one that matters does see. And so I've just got to keep that in my mind, in my heart, and know that I'm just not going to be overwhelmed by it all. The idea behind the word weary is exhausted. You, you know what that feels like, don't you? I'm not just talking about physically. You know what it feels like spiritually, don't you? To be tired, to be worn out. Maybe you've been strong in your work for God for many years. Maybe you've been a servant. You've served the, the church. You've served your brethren. You've served your God. And all these years, that's just been such a, a, a wonderful part of who you are. And now you're You're tired. Just don't, don't give up. Don't be weary because God sees and God knows. And so many places where this shows up, you know, somebody gets weary and they just miss services. I'm just tired today. And then that becomes two. And then becomes three. And before long, we're gone more than we're here. And, you know, it shows up in other ways. It's not just in, a, in attendance. It also can be seen in the, the work of the church, you know. What do you do to further the cause of Christ here? You know, there are people that start out on fire. They, they want to be involved. They want to be active. And they, they, they want to be important even. That's where it starts to get into the problem. We, we think we need to be important. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I cannot get to the place where I cannot finish. I have to finish the race. I have to finish the race or it's all worthless. So here's how this, the idea of what I've tried to put together with this. It, it starts with this decision that I make in my life that I'm going to plan. I am planning for God to be a part of every day of my life, which that means I'm going to put into practice certain things that, that make that happen. But I understand that there's a challenge, that it's not going to be easy that it is an uphill battle, that there are going to be hurdles and mountains before me, and so I've got to make a commitment. Not only am I planning for him to be there, but I'm going to be strong enough to see it through. I am not going to grow weary on those hard days. I'm not going to quit before the race is done. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be faithful in my studying of the Bible. I'm going to be faithful in my prayer life. I'm going to be faithful in my giving. I'm going to be faithful in being together with my brethren to worship. I'm going to be faithful in reaching out to the lost. And I'm going to finish. I'm going to finish. Number three, let's have more compassion for the lost. I read a portion of a sermon by a, another preacher that I know, and he made a statement that I've only heard the one time, uh, or read the one time, uh, and uh, 
I don't think this will ever leave my mind again. Uh, that preacher said, how much do you have to hate someone to refuse to share the gospel with them? Isn't that powerful? I mean, there are some things that I know. I know that the blood of Jesus has the power to wash away sins. I know that. I know that Jesus died on the cross to make that possible. I know that it is only through the gospel of Christ and the teaching of that gospel that somebody can come to a knowledge of that truth and obey the gospel to become a Christian and have their sins washed away. And therefore, I know that if there are people who do not have the opportunity to hear that or somebody doesn't take that gospel to them, then they are remaining in a lost condition. How much do I have to hate somebody to just say, yeah, I'm just not going to tell them? How much do I have to hate somebody to be willing to look at them knowing that they are lost and on a way to an eternity in hell and still walk away? Listen, this is a compassionate church. It is. Uh, and I am thankful to be a part of this family. But you and I live around lost people every day. Every day. And if you're waiting for somebody to come up with some great outreach plan to do it, people in your life are going to go to hell. Because that's not going to do it. The only way the gospel spreads, rightfully so, is Christians taking it with them to the people in their lives. Now, are they going to listen? Not all of them. Experience already tells you that probably not even most of them. But what if there's one? What if there's one? One person in your life that really would listen to the gospel. And you didn't tell them. Luke chapter 15 is one of the saddest and yet happiest chapters in the Bible. There are three parables in this uh, chapter that Jesus gives about the lost. And the first one is about one sheep. One sheep that has been lost from the flock of a hundred and the shepherd goes. He even leaves the 99 behind to go and find that one lost sheep, and he brings that sheep back. And that parable closes in Luke 15, verse 7, by this, these words. I say to you, likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. So go find that one sheep. The second parable, there's one coin out of a group of ten, and this woman has lost it, and she's tearing the house apart, trying to find that one coin and finally she does find it and she rejoices with her neighbors and then Jesus adds in Luke 15 and verse 10 likewise I say to you there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents go find that one coin and then the third parable the prodigal son you remember him He's the one that actually chose to walk away. The others were lost. This one chose it. He, he got his inheritance from his father. He said, I, I don't want to wait till you die. Give it to me now. And he went off and he wasted it in sinful living. And he finally came to his senses. And he finally walked home. And his father rejoiced. And he made this feast. And in Luke 15 and verse 32, Jesus, using that father in the parable to talk about our father, says this, that that father said, your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Go find that lost brother. You think about the number of people in our world today and the knowledge of how many people are lost. It becomes overwhelming from time to time. And I can't reach them all. I can't. You can't reach them all. But there are people in the circle of my life that need to hear. Find that one lost. Number four, let's be easy to get along with. Genesis chapter 13 is where this comes from. And you remember the account where God has called Abraham out of his homeland and he's taken him to show him this land that his descendants will ultimately inherit. And uh, he's been blessed immensely. 
And in this account, Lot is there with him, and they've both been blessed. In fact, the, the blessings are so great that there's just not room for them all right now. And even the servants of Abraham and Lot, they're kind of fighting with each other. And, and Abraham's the one that God called out of the land. Lot's just come along, right? So Abraham's the one that has the right to do whatever he wants to do. And yet, in Genesis 13, beginning in verse 8, he says to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. You take the left, I'll go to the right, or if you go to the right, I'll go to the left. The point is, I don't have to always have to have my way. The point is, listen, when it comes to doctrine, that's already been settled. God settled that in His Word. But when it comes to the expediencies or the opinions and all of that, I must be willing to even set aside mine, no matter how good they are, for the benefit of us being able to get along. I think that's what Paul was writing about in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 24 when he said, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. We've got to care about each other to the point to where we want what's best with each other. We have to have a kindness with each other. And so I've got to make a commitment. This is all part of this plan that we're talking about that we're not going to grow weary in. I've got to make this commitment that I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that you and I, well, we're going to get along. We're going to figure it out. Finally, let's cultivate a hatred for sin. Now, if you were here a few weeks ago, you know that Rich had a Sunday night sermon that he, uh, he kind of changed the words of the song. Remember the song, They'll Know We Are Christians By Our Love? And his sermon that night was on the idea of they'll know we're Christians by our hate. And he talked about how sometimes the way that we do things and the things that we say causes the world to know us more for the things that we oppose than for the things that we support, right? The things that we believe. I'm not contradicting that sermon by this point. But I am wanting us to recognize that we have to know what God thinks about things. We have to know what God thinks about things. And there are things that God loves. And there are things that God hates. And the things that God hates are always things that will cause me to be lost. I've got to know that. I need to let God define sin and I need to abide by what God says. I need to be different than the world because Jesus was different than the world. I find Psalm 119, it, it's a chapter that everybody knows exists because it's a trivia question of the longest chapter in the Bible, right? Psalm 119, does anybody know what it says? It actually says some very powerful things about God's law. Psalm 119, 104, through your precepts, I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Why would you hate a false way? Because it causes people to be lost. It causes people to be lost. Psalm 119, 113, I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. Why would you hate that wishy-washy faith? Because it causes people to be lost. Psalm 119, 163, I hate and abhor lying, but I love your law. There's a context there. He's not just talking about somebody that tells a lie, though that obviously is a sin. He's talking about somebody who tells a lie in contrast to God's law. Well, that's happening. How many times do you suppose you could go around to the various religious groups and say, tell me, how can I be saved? And yet an answer different than what God says. And what that is, is a lie. You hate sin? You see families destroyed by sin, does that not make you hate it? You see lives destroyed by sin, does that not make you hate it? I'm not telling you I'm perfect, you know better than that. You're not perfect either, I know that. But I also know that my failures are my failures. And I'm not going to choose to live that way. The world can shout at me every day that I've got to accept sin, but it's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. I love God too much. I hate what causes us to be lost. And that's why our God hates sins. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Kids are back in school. 
Maybe that makes the house a little cleaner. It definitely makes it quieter. And now I get a chance to think a little bit. And I decide that I'm going to make a commitment to start again. I'm going to start again. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to make commitments for my future. I'm going to truly commit to loving my brethren and loving the lost and loving the Lord. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to make sure that no matter what tomorrow brings, that the circumstances don't change what the day is. And so the day is going to be better than today. Not because my circumstances are always going to be great. Not because it's going to always be sunny. But because I'm going to grow closer to God. Can you make that commitment today? If you're not a Christian, today's the day to make the commitment. You don't have all the answers for the future. You don't have all the decisions made, the little things that are going to have to change, but you make the big commitment today that says, today I'm going to join with Him. I'm going to be buried in baptism, allowing the blood of Jesus to wash away my sins, and the rest of it I'll, I'll conquer as we walk. You can start that journey today. Or if you're a Christian who went away from Him, you're the prodigal. doesn't matter how you got out there. If you've gone away from God, you're the prodigal. And there are people looking for that one sheep. People looking for that one coin. And people ready to hug the neck and welcome back that son. That's you. You need to come home. Whatever your needs are, if you need to respond,